governor's uh, passed away, um, Kaiser. Kaiser, and so flags in Vermont will be lowered uh, at half seven. Uh, long before my time, I guess 1962, he was governor of Vermont. Does that oh. right? sound about right? Yeah. Been downhill since. <laughs> he was the youngest governor at 34. Yeah. And, and I don't know if it, and I don't know if it was an accurate statement, but uh, on NPR this morning they were saying that it was really began the transition of Vermont from a very conservative state to more of a liberal state. It's been so, downhill since. And so you tried to blame that on me. Right? So, <laughs> uh, How much it's politics politics? And also, I also want to note that this is uh, International Women's Week. Yesterday was International Women's Day, so. I want to recognize that. And with that, uh, we'll begin introductions. I'm Jim Kalkeen, uh, superintendent of the supervisory union here. We'll go around this way. Mike Kiori, the assistant director for adult education here at the CDC. Mike Waller, superintendent director here at the Tech Center. Meg Hunt Singer, assistant director here at the CDC. Mary Morrissey, um, representative district 22 Bennington. Uh, Tim Payne, middle school principal. Uh, Representative Bill Botso, Pound and Woodford. Rick Pembroke, SVSU. Genevieve Plunkett, BSD Board. Jackie <clears throat> Kelly, BSD and CDC Board. Uh, Frank Kenny, Shasbury. Larry Johnson, Shasbury. Ken Smith, BSD and uh, SVSU. George Slayman, BSD. Karen Director of Educational Technology at SVSU. Time to walk in. What I'd like to do next, uh, our, my custom is to give any of our representatives or senators here to make a few opening remarks on what you've been work, uh, working on up to date, and then we will open it up uh, for <coughs> questions and discussions. So, Mary, if you'd like to go first, or Bill, whichever one feels ready. Bill, feel free. Uh, Commerce and Economic Development is my committee. It has been for a number of years. And uh, as we prepare for crossover week, I think we have uh, give you a sense of where we're going. Um, is been working on a lot of bills that are must-do bills for every session. They are things that probably wouldn't rise to the top of your uh, uh, radar screen. Like it's, it's time for us to take a deep look at how LLCs are formed, level of liability corporations and the uh, Vermont Bar Association has brought us that work to do and that's a I think it's about a 120 page bill to move through it's a commerce bill and uh, you just have to do it carefully it's a model bill another one is um, you know Vermont has one of the best insurance regimes in the na nation and it's because uh, the legislature and the Department of Financial Regulation work uh, very hard to keep our um, policies up to date and we're coming up for accreditation by the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. And that is, uh, to do that, there's a few bills we need to pass. We have one on principle-based reserving, for instance, for life insurance. I won't go into what it is. I think, uh, you know, let me know. We also have a, uh, some technical amendments to unemployment insurance. Um, we've been spending most of our time working on uh, economic development, and uh, what you do is you work it out with the Senate. And uh, Kevin Mullen from Rutland, he's my counterpart chair, he'll send over a economic development bill. We've been taking testimony in various aspects already, you've probably seen in the paper, the uh, speakers <coughs> done a good job of saying what are the various ideas out there, let's collect them and organize them. So uh, we'll use his bill to add on to whatever he's been able to accomplish, move that. And we'll also do, uh, there's a consumer protection bill, it's always important, and when I say consumer protection, that's consumer protection for both businesses and for individuals. Uh, there's always some um, core work that needs to be done and understandable in a um, competitive capitalist system as it should be that you always... Good morning, Mary Anthony, the Korean Center, and all my little friends over here. We might have to pause for you because it's... Much nicer. We don't turn that up here, right? <laughs> you have to work on the... Software class, this is the last week to sell Yankee candles, so sell, sell, sell. You have your package ready to hand in, which includes all order forms and payments. They can be dropped off to Mrs. Dewey in the main office, no later than Friday the 13th. Thank you for your hard work. 
Well, maybe I'll just consider, maybe I'll consider that the hook and pass it over to Mary. I would say one thing more because I think it uh, pertains so much. <laughs> he goes on a while. Everyone to wear their shirt inside out because it matters more what is on the inside than is what on the outside. And that's the correct answer to last week's last trivia question on this day, which was March 5th in 2002. This crazy family debuted on MTV. I am so the father by the head of a bat, though. Why not? It's not the upright. It's the trivia question of the day. Thomas Lawrence, Chicken Morgan for the Lacey, Rosenthal, Murphy, Brigham, Slade, Jones, Poland, Cogeshell, and Shonen. All earn a point in the top ten. Here is today's trivia question. On this day, March 9th, in the year 1562, Doing this in public is made illegal in Naples, Italy, and punishable by death. What is it? Again, on this day, 1562, doing this in public is made illegal in Naples, Italy, and punishable no, by death. Count on Jim. I was just sitting on the sidewalk, was my death guess. Is but, death yeah. is too yeah. It's a lighthearted way to start the squad. I don't know. Punishable <laughs> <laughs> by death. Anyway, I just wanted to say is that a part of economic development for us is always uh, workforce <laughs> and the connection between education, uh, educators, uh, employers, and employees. And that really is at the core of all the work that a lot of you do. And I know from our uh, Bennington Economic Development Partners workforce meetings that that's something we focus on. And I uh, do know one thing I can report, I don't think there's a bill, and there may not even need to be one, but trying to build a better bridge between our career development centers and our employers, uh, especially in the hands-on experiential learning that we do a lot of down here. But there are more and more ways to do it. I think is to build direct and um, fruitful connections with companies. And I will cite that we did go a very interesting field trip, uh, you know, as a model with GW Plastics. It's in Bethel. They're a competitor of Mac, about the same size. And what they actually do is that they have students from the school, the high school, go and take a class in the in the building, in the factory. It's a different model of a kind. And they, they find students who want to do this. They guarantee them a paid inter internship over the summer. And then upon completion, and they work with Vermont uh, uh, Technical College as well, is that they will have a job when they enter there, and uh, specific skills areas that are important to that area. So I think, thought that was a very interesting approach that might be something that um, would be a model that would be emerged and might, may or may not be appropriate here. You won't know best. That's all. Thank you. Well, let me see. There's a lot on the table, obviously, in Montpelier. Um, Rick's come several times, actually, to speak before the education. A lot of moving parts within education. Um, I don't see a real solid Plan. There's a number of bills out there, but I think some are conflicting with others, and I think how you get to the end line is, is, is going to be a challenge. Um, you know, talking about a couple of years out for some of these initiatives, such as consolidation and other pieces happening, but we've been doing that for years, so I don't know, as we're trying to get our, our arms around property tax, um, you know, that's a challenge. Um, my committee is general housing and military. I also do a lot of still um, work in the health care committee. You've got a number of proposals. The um, I think it's now down to, uh, at least when we left, it's a 0.7, I think, of payroll tax still on the docket. There's 
a number of different taxes coming from uh, different committees. I think the one challenge for me this year is I'm seeing the major pieces of legislation with major dollar amounts, um, such as the water quality bill has um, dealing mostly with Lake Champlain as I think at this point, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Bill, about a $60 million price tag on it. Over the years, we have poured in as a legislature quite a number of tens of millions of dollars not to get the best results, and we want to be doing that. Lake Champlain is a great um, asset for Vermont, but how do we do it and get the results as we're pouring the money into it? So bills are coming out in a little different way where policy and money is not coming out as one whole bill. And so you're getting four or five different committees looking at it with different things coming at you in different directions. Uh, we are looking at 118 to 120, and it may even be higher with this uh, month's revenues that are down uh, of a, a shortfall in the budget. And that's not even talking about the new initiatives on top of that. Um, everything's on the table from, as we left on uh, a week ago, um, closing Windsor Prison, closing the Veterans Home, closing this. I mean, there's a lot of pieces out there moving. As far as education, as I said, I think this is going to be a slow move. Um, I guess it didn't take us, it took us a, longer time to get here and with the property taxes and the concerns watching uh, the town meetings last week and there, I think 20 at this point budgets went down that's a considerably less than last year but I'm not sure what that really reflects um, I think folks were uh, hopeful that around the state um, that we're getting our arms around, you know, the education piece and the quality of that, as well as moving forward with the property tax. I'm not really totally sure we're there. Um, hopefully, by the end of the session, um, health care is a still a huge concern with um, how we're going to get there. Though it's not being necessarily called single payer, we have a new name for it, and technically it will end up probably being single payer under a different name. Um, I can't even begin to tell you the tens to hundred, several hundred million that has gone into that exchange, which um, is limping along at best. I know one of the proposals that came out um, of the health committee last um, a week ago was not to, we were trying to get it so that for the smaller businesses and that, it would be a little bit more manageable and that was voted down out of committee, which is unfortunate um, as we see what's happening with some of our smaller businesses. And uh, as, as Bill was talking about economic development, what kind of all, all hands need to be on deck for what we're doing. Um, so there are many moving parts. Um, I'm hopeful. Um, but I may not hold my breath on some of them. And, um, you know, I guess the next couple of months we'll see. We've got another week until crossover, which means the bills that come out of the House, um, I think it's Friday, is it, Bill? Right. Yes, um, have to make crossover, and then bills can't go. You know, sometimes they'll go on in different ways as well as Senate <coughs> bills come over to the House. And um, as I said, lots of moving parts. Thank you. Um, two things I want to say before we open up. One, I do want to recognize Genevieve Pluckett, who is our newest board member. So if any of you are wondering, she was just elected to BSD, so this is her first meeting. Okay. And uh, for those who don't know, Karen Burnell is winding down her time with us. She uh, gave us her intent to retire, so she won't have many legislative breakfasts left. Can't. But, but thank you. So, um, for us, obviously, the uh, the House Education Committee bill that has come out of that committee and then gone to the House is is a concern. I know neither one of you serve on on that on the Education Committee, but I'm sure you're familiar with it. And uh, so, some of the uh, components of that bill and the impact to us is certainly a concern for us. Um, I don't know how many have had a 
a chance to read it yet. But uh, with that, I'll open it up with whoever wants to go first, has a concern they'd like to raise. At uh, <clears throat> point on seven, I heard payroll tax. I spoke with Rick, and he was saying that it would probably cost the SDSU for its employees around $300,000 of money that would normally go for kids' education, supplies, teachers, and so forth. On top of the bill you passed last year that's charging us for the retirements, trying to save the uh, teachers' retirement, which cost us another 300000 So what you're basically doing is taking $600,000 out of the pockets of the kids here in our community that are you know, trying to get a good education and saving other things. And to me, at seven, you should put it on the employees or split it half, half uh, three, five on employees and maybe three, uh, half on uh, bosses. Uh, and the saving of the uh, pension fund, uh, maybe we should just raise the rate that people contribute to the pension fund instead of uh, you know, having the districts, because the districts don't only have so many dollars, especially with the federal dollars drying up right now, that we need as much as possible. So, uh, you know, I think that, you know, think twice before you vote for that 0.07. It seems like a very small number. It really does. But when you see employers with millions and millions of dollars worth of payroll, it comes up to be a pretty big number. Uh, um, and I agree with you on that. I, I think um, we're really needing to look at what our, the priorities are, and there may need to be in some areas, some moratoriums looked at of, of kind of pet projects that have gone on over the years, um, which are, you know are are, are um, valid. But we may have to look at in these times. Um, I think we are at a point, or I know we're at a point, where the stimulus money from the federal government was kind of a false. Um, I guess plateau for us for a time where it even um, you know it shored up some of our shortfalls. But now um, it's hitting the fan. Um, there are there are no uh, funding mechanisms, and what that would do, and actually the 0.7 percent um, payroll tax is looked to in costs. Um, what's the term I want to say? Um, it's in the um, cost shift uh, that they're wanting to have somehow shored up, and it actually won't even meet that mark. So again, it's going that direction, but it won't even correct the problem that it's trying to solve. You, can, you know, unless you have some hard numbers. I mean, that Obamacare stuff, that had a three-year lead before it even kicked in. So you had three years to prepare for it. Now it's been going for two years, and you're not going to have any uh, working mechanism here in this state until, what, August, you were saying? I mean, you know, it's ridiculous. It's going to be like six years. It doesn't work. And you, you spent $100 million. No, on. several hundred million dollars, $200 million, and that's an and underestimate think... on the system. <clears throat> it does not work. As a matter of fact, in a couple of minutes, I've got to get on to the commissioner for constituent with a health care problem um, under the exchange. And... Uh, those are the challenges going forward is we've got to fix the problem and it keeps going out further and further. Um, I did put on the floor during budget adjustment an amendment that actually looked to, we were looking to put another $10 million into the system um, and my amendment was to, the money would be there but certain benchmarks had to be met before any money was released. And unfortunately, um, or fortunately, I guess I should say, um, the um, Appropriations Committee kind of took hostage of my uh, amendment and made it their amendment, but did the same thing. So in, in, in that regards, I'm happy that it passed, but it was like they should have been doing that work because we just keep throwing money at the problem with no results. And now they are looking to summer to even see if this may possibly work. And they're waiting for waivers as well. But to a degree, Ken, and I mean it respectfully, you're preaching to the choir as far as, you know, with, with me on this issue. These are very concerning, wanting to work, wanting to, to um, support our citizens across the state, but it, this is a challenge. Uh, 
I think part of the education bill basically has a moratorium on anything that would increase school, uh, you know, any mandate to the school. I wonder if that would protect your concern. Well, I heard the governor before the election, I think it was, he said no more unfunded mandates in his state. Well, it's in the education bill, so you brought the concern that there would be 300000 in payroll tax, and I hadn't thought about it before, but I wonder how those two things work together. It sounds like if the mandate wins, you'd be protected. Well, but we've because all, it would well, be a mandate to your payroll. But well, we've also been told there's no going to be no broad-based taxes, and again, I guess that depends upon what you call a tax and how you frame it. Yeah. <coughs> tax is a tax is a tax, but that's my humble opinion. So anyway. <clears throat> Well, uh, to, to uh, fund the health care, why weren't state workers brought into the health care? That has been the question. Actually, there was a proposal last week, um, or it's been kind of floating around, um, with the teachers union being going from their plan to being in the exchange. And that has had great opposition because, quite honestly, I will remind you all, and unfortunately you've heard me say this before, all hands need to be on deck for this exchange if it is going to work. The original, um, the author of the health care bill said that you would need a million citizens to barely even try to float this boat. The state of Vermont has 630,000 people of that at this point. So we're in the hole before we begin. So if everyone's not in this plan, and we're now trying to get a waiver for Medicare, and though Medicare has its challenges, it's a system that's worked and has supported our seniors. I don't think we want to, as a state, when we've got an exchange that's not working, add our seniors in and put them at major risk as well. I, I, th I think you would have a tough battle on your hands if you touched anything that said Medicare. Well, and again, I have, I have a bill in right now that that is removed from this waiver that we're trying to get from the federal government because that is a huge problem. They're, try every, they're trying to get state employees to, they're trying to get the Teachers Association on the plan, and it's having great resistance. So I don't know how we're going to do this. I, you know, you need to have everyone paying in if, if that's what we're doing as a state. And I don't think we can look to, I, I, I mean, I just scratch my head saying several hundred million dollars. And by the way, the health care will be at the end of, the, um, of this. They've been talking the 1.6 or 7 billion. It's even hard to get that word out. And then it's gone up to 2.3 billion, and I've estimated, and, and now the figures are coming out. About a year ago, I said it's probably likely to be a four to five billion dollars. How does the state do this? How does it? What would you say? What would you say if you didn't do it? And why why not go on the federal program? Well, that was one of the things. That was my question two years ago. Why is Vermont, as a small state, launching out on their own, doing the, you know, as a single state, doing their own exchange? And we, I, the answer was, you know, we can do it better. Didn't happen. Didn't happen. And, um, you know, um, the, you know, the other thing is, is. It was not estimated, and that's one of the challenges going forward right now. I, again, a couple of years ago when we were going to this exchange, had said, why aren't we improving Medicaid and getting those cost shifts addressed? And you already would have had a system that could have possibly done the same thing. We now have had with the rollout of the exchange, we have had, um, and I don't want to quote the figure, we have had an overestimated amount of, of folks now that have gone in naturally to Medicaid. You could have had a system that shifted um, without possibly having the exchange, but also having it on the federal level, but with the Medicaid. So I don't know how this is going to end up. 
but uh, the proposals out there are uh, pretty challenging and they are looking to have this waiver from the federal government that it, we've been told is very unlikely that we will ever get. So that puts great stress all the way around on the state as well. These are some of the huge problems we've got. Is there any state that, that has their own program and it's working? Um, is Maryland, Maryland's got, but I don't, I think, I'm trying to think. Kentucky's I, got that. Kentucky's some got, moment. yes, it's Kentucky that's got the, uh, that's <coughs> somewhat working, but most are in the federal exchange. Of course, one of the things about the federal exchange, everybody knows this, there's a Supreme Court case and has to do with whether or not subsidies would only be for those who, uh, where a state has its own exchange or not. And, uh, you know, I don't, you probably don't want to expose yourself to that risk as that decision's coming up in a couple of months anyway. Well, and to piggyback on subsidies, actually there's going to be an impact for citizens that, um, I, my understanding is, and it's been out there for about a, a half a year or longer, the subsidies that some folks got within the exchange are actually probably going to have some tax implications as you are doing your tax um, returns this year. And so those have just come out and um, <laughs> I can't begin to tell you the challenges that's creating as well. You said everything's on the table, and one thing that helped us this year is they deferred the early childhood. You, know, you could opt out to not do it this year. Have you heard any discussions at all about continuing that deferment because of the cost that might be involved? I have not at this point because we're looking at all of the other bills with property tax and that that may be in the mix somewhere. Um, <coughs> I guess a little bit of my concern, and the early childhood is, um, program is important. And as um, you know, and I'll say it publicly for all of you, you know, the challenge for me last year was I didn't support the bill because there was no funding. Right. And then we got this three million dollar, I think, statewide grant. But quite honestly, that's minimal to what you need statewide to run it. Um, so I, I have not heard where that will continue, so I don't know what the programs that are there, what will happen. Um, this has been happening for a long, you know, for a number of years. The federal government has been pretty much pump kicking their responsibilities to the state and the state to the towns. And there's just, I'm sorry to say, there's just not money to do everything we want to do. I don't know how this is going. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're you know, main t struggling to maintain what we currently have. Adding another age level uh, really concerns me, though the merits of it, you know, you can't argue against it, but, right, right. but it does lack the funding. Right. And, and that is, unfortunately, what we do often is we overpromise, underdeliver, and we set up for programs that then have to limp along or you have to change how you're doing different pieces of education. And I, it's, I would, you know, rather that we, and it's not easy to say, take a year to look and seriously look and look at all of our priorities and how they presently line up. Um, we just keep layering and giving the pretense that we're adding on these great things for you and we're giving you unfunded mandates even though we're telling you we're not. There's some honesty there. Thank well, you. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, it is what it is. Um, Jim, can I just respond to that? I, I wouldn't want our legislators to feel that everyone here agrees with the sentiment that we need to slow down on the, on the three-year-old pre-K. I mean, I'm, I'm one who doesn't, for example. Uh, so. Do you have any ideas how we go forth to fund it or resource it or anything else? Uh, well, I think we would continue to fund it the way we fund the rest of education, through, through the statewide property tax system. 
And I'd say that the, the public statewide supported, as everybody here knows, education at the, at the ballot last week with you know, very few, relatively few defeats. And, and as, a, as an indicator of how the public feels about whether we're spending too much on education, I'd say that doesn't signal that there's a problem. I would probably contend that last week's vote might have been a reflection of, of folks statewide thinking that um, we as a legislature are moving to address some of the issues with education, property tax, the whole, you know, look at what we're doing. So I think, um, and that, um, as I said early on, may be a challenge because I don't see some of the initiatives probably for happening for, if at all, for probably a couple of years. Uh, this isn't going to be an easy one-year fix of what anything anyone's doing. So again, I'm appreciative that you know the hopefully the voters out there across the state are hoping for us to be resolving some of these issues, but I don't see it necessarily in this year. Well, I mean, I think that's one way of looking at it, that, that the voters that the voters felt that the legislature was looking at it carefully and moving forward, but um, I, I'm not sure I agree with that either. <laughs> I think the, the general, the population, doesn't pay a whole lot of attention to what's going on in Montpelier. Well, I think it's also fair to say is that there's a lot of really hard work done by school boards and administrators here and across the state, and I right. think that it's probably yeah, the key factor as to why uh, you have reasonable increases and reasonable votes and I think it's because people are doing everything they can to be diligent and if there's anybody in this room who doesn't want to have the best education possible for uh, the future they're in the wrong room today mm -hmm. I think we all know that so it is a matter of you know what's the best way to uh, you know, use what we got I think change is very very difficult I think change has happened in the past. I think uh, you know, it's not lost on me how many schools I drove by today that are no longer schools and how many schools there are that are schools. It's not lost on me that the, the vast changes that are coming just through uh, the broadband build out that we need to do more of in your schools. So I did actually have a question, not to change the subject too much, but does every uh, school have uh, cable to the building in the SVSU? Fiber, not cable, fiber. Yes. How many, do they all have fiber right now to the yes. building? <coughs> that is good news. So that means that now you have capacity that you didn't have before for education in any variety of ways that are emerging. It sounds like it, um, Bill, but because there's fiber coming to the building, every building doesn't necessarily have fiber within the building. Yes, there's a long way to go, but I think you know the shorter the copper, yeah. uh, the better. And you'll never have it entirely. There's copper inside your devices right here that's on fiber there. But it does give, uh, you know, that there is a real place for equity in education and uh, long distance learning and also for the parts on the workforce development of getting people the particular skills for the occupations that are needed going forward. Fully, I just wanted to say, I, you know, I'm in favor of the early childhood add-on as well. And the problem that I'm having is to make sure we understand the, in, the economic impact on the local entrepreneurs that are now housing and supporting the three-year-olds that we're talking about coming in. But then the part of that is that I'm struggling with, when we say public education, is it any leeway? And that's Bill and, and Gary, in the sense that once we say go three public, and then we got the local entrepreneurs that are, that are managing these kids now, is there any 50-50 with the word public associated with it where those kids can still be uh, managed and overall managed by the supervisory union? Parents pay a portion of some fund because they got them in there now, which the impact won't be so great for those that are sending the kids, but the, 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 the program can be managed in a manner, in a way that, that, that we can get those three. 
three years in three years old in there because I, it's it's really hurting us not to to bring the, these kids over. We just look around and see who's lagging in the in the in the town and in the systems and so forth. It's those that don't get that early intervention, and so it, it's it's painful. But we need to try to find a way to get that thing on the road. And let's keep in mind we're talking ten hours a week. That's right. all. That, that's right. That's all we're is under the proposal is a minimum of ten hours. Right. Now, Karen, do you have a, an answer to Leanne on that? Um, if I, 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 I think I understand what you're saying. Parents are paying a large portion of their child care experience. Um, what the, what we will would do. So many children are in care for 40 hours, 50 hours, 30 hours a week, and what we're um, funding um, is the 10 hours a week. So we're, we're just funding a very small portion of their day, but we're hoping that the effects throughout the entire time that a child's in care, that we're increasing the quality of those 40 hours, even though we're really focusing on 10 of in, instructional time. And, so, and to, so to ask parents to pay more when one of the things on the table is around child care subsidies and those mm -hmm. not fully funding and creating waiting lists which in, in impacts on employment of families, um, <clears throat> to ask families to bear more of it I think is unrealistic. I, if, that, if that's what you were well, suggesting. Well that's, that's one part of it, but then the other part of it, if this, the supervisor, I mean the supervisor union, I'm saying, were say deputy ties, to say all of the child cares for the three year olds became part of that, but individual entrepreneurs, but there were guidelines, which you have some things out here, that you would say when you want to take that other uh, part of them that are, that are already out there for the 20 hours or whatever hours a week, but they, they fall up under the guidelines that you want to have them do to make sure that they get what they need, and that's the other part of boosting out here along that line. So. And there, there are expectations that they have to meet in order to be a partner. And part of that is a participation in the Step Ahead Recognition Program, which is STARS. And facilities need four stars or five stars to be able to be a partner. Or three stars within a plan that they're going to get that fourth star within a certain part of time. Um, part of the Early Learning Challenge Grant that came through is um, going to be having regional quality um, control folks who will be actually going in. Right now, you um, it's a paperwork um, application. Um, there's an on-site assessment. Um, you have to send a lot of documentation to the state about your quality, but what they've added is actually people coming in that would not be SU employees, would be state employees, that would be monitoring and supporting that quality. So the expectations that I think um, you're talking about exist, but they're ramping up. Um, to um, make sure that they can see it in action on a regular basis. Well, and I wish actually we had um, Alice Miller, who's on the House Education, as well as Brian Campion, who's on the Senate Education, because they could probably really give us the update of where some of the different initiatives are. Um, as I said, there's so much on the table in, in many of the committees that it's hard to know, you know, kind of the um, you know, all of the discussions that are being had, but I really have not heard a solid plan on that. And I think, Leanne, locally what we're trying to do is we're trying to, um, in, as an SVSU, we're trying to increase the number of providers that meet the high quality standards because we have um, many, but there's still many more that are just entering into the um, STARS record, uh, recognition system. Um, they're at one and two stars, and I commend them for starting at a starting point. Um, but we're trying to build the capacity of folks who are able to meet that standard so that we can expand on the number that we have in our SVSU. Because we may find ourselves in a position where we have a law that says three and four year olds will have um, access, must have access, they're entitled to that service, but we may not have providers to be able to provide that service. So it would be safe then, we're not trying to get the, the third graders into the actual physical buildings, no. 
just to keep, I wanted to make sure, you know, yeah. that everybody realized that, that that entrepreneur type of thing is, is out there, but you're not trying to say we got to add a building on to bring them in here and add them on over here. You're talking about debitizing and keeping, I use that word, all of those out there and manage them from that position or that part of the thing, which I, I think is a, a smart way to do that. Well, if you think about it, um, parents need full day, full care to be yeah. employed. So we want to have children in facilities where um, parents can keep their employment and children don't have to right. make multiple transitions. Um, so that's really important. And, and just, if we were to take, just, we did an estimate a couple years ago, if we were just looking at the four-year-olds, if we were to bring all the four-year-olds into the schools, we would need uh, like, almost 30 classrooms. Yeah. And you know, we're not in a position to provide 30 classrooms, and nor does it work for families who are employed to follow a school year schedule. So it does make that sense. So why does the state ramp up to oversee this by local visits? We can hear you, can't hear you. Why does the state, um, it seems to me that you're saying that the state is um, creating its own system to evaluate programs. And um, why are they, isn't that your job as the SU? Um, it's part of our job right now as the SU, um, but we're not the grantor or the, of the STARS um, credentials. It's or similar the stars to, a, numbers. to a high, like, uh, high school getting their accreditation. Okay. An outside agency comes in and certifies that they meet the standards. And that's what but I have a different implication from what Karen said. I have an implication that they were going to be uh, not just uh, evaluating for stars, but actually overseeing that the operation maintained it. They are. They, they are. are. They but are. that's an annual thing or what? An annual. I, there were still rolling out the details, but what they want to do is they want to have regional representation. People regionally would, you know, they'll break the and part, part of the argument behind How many that, additional people is that? Well, it's part, I don't know, and it's part of the Early Learning Challenge grant funds. That's what I can so tell you right now. this comes from the $30 million grant? Either the 30 or the 50, I'm not sure which one. But are there they, two, or are they just There's, there's, there's several, there's, no, there's several. <coughs> and, and uh, you know, you should also look at this part, whereby, yes, we fund 10 hours of 40 hours a week, but the people that we're engaging are doing the other 30 hours. So because we're uh, helping them uh, raise their standards, you're also raising the standards for the other 30 hours. So it's, it's money well spent. Because it goes to, the data shows that if it's not a high quality program, any benefit from the early childhood education diminishes by third grade. So it, the standards, you know, it, it's a good thing that the standards are raised. The question still comes back. Who's paying for it? Question is more me. Is there any other topic anyone would like to discuss, Larry? Just wanted to touch on something Bill said. Mary mentioned it as well as the uh, mandates that have accumulated in the state of Vermont. Um, the School Board Association back in 2003 released a 19 page analysis of the effect and their recommendations. Uh, for dealing with some of those mandates. And again, in 2003 to 2013, they released another report for additional mandates that had come on board and laws that had come on board in that time frame. Also with the recommendations of some things that may, may should be changed or they felt should be changed. Um, I guess my point is it, it, it's maybe time to revisit that and see if there's some things that are no longer appropriate or that we can shift those costs from those mandates into another area rather than leave them uh, accumulating in the education uh, fund as we've done. Uh, the, that's one point. Uh, another point is since I mentioned there's also 225 pages of regulations that deal with uh, just special education in the state of Vermont. Uh, that's somewhat burdensome and expensive, I believe. Uh, I think we should be looking at that 
uh, closely to see if, again, there's costs that may be appropriate to put someplace else. I'm not suggesting we eliminate uh, parts of those programs. I'm just saying uh, maybe we should take the burden off the property taxpayer in the state of Vermont. And since I mentioned special ed, uh, I know that the Education Committee uh, is uh, voiced the need for a study to look at the, uh, the funding of the special ed program in the state of Vermont. And I, I don't mean to put the burden for answering to that on you folks. I, I'm disappointed our, our two members of the Education Committees from the Senate and the representative, the House of Representatives are not here this morning to, to perhaps address us. But uh, do you have any knowledge of what that, the intent of that study? And if in fact it's going to take place? Well, I'll just humbly say I'm concerned about another study because I would think with any program we do, there should be the data that is ongoing um, as to what the best results are in, in, in any program. And I find not only, I'm not referring that always to you know, just to education, but that's what we're speaking about here. I find it across the board where we're not always looking at what we're doing on some of these programs um, and, uh, you know, and how they're rolling out and are they rolling out the way it was expected and where are the, the problems so that we can look to address if there are indeed problems. And I don't see that happening on a regular basis with some of the pieces of legislation over the years, but that's my humble opinion. Thank you. I'm just trying to see if I can find that section of the bill here. Because unfortunately, it's better sometimes we study, but then no, I've got it right here. we don't look to always go according to what it says, or you know, there's pros and cons of anything. But sometimes we don't move on the money we put into this, you know, into a study, and what are we looking at for a result? I think my answer is basically this is something I think you would want the legislature to look at. You know, I, I would assume that you're pleased that they would look at uh, you know, how you go about doing, doing this. The bill says, uh, a couple of things it says, uh, is consider ways in which the proposal could also help to reduce administrative responsibilities at the local level and increase flexibility in the provision of services. Consider ways in which some portion of the state funds for special education services could be provided to school districts or supervisory unions based on average daily membership. And there are other pieces as well. And um, what it's asking is for the Secretary of Education um, should develop this. And I think maybe your question is, would be is that, do you want to leave this in the hands of the Secretary of Education or do you want to uh, be part of it? Um, do you think that Basically, it should be a working group, it should be a task force, or do you think the best way to go about it is have the Secretary of Education be the one who would put these things on the table? What would be the supervisory unions and all these various people's position as the best way to address think, the problem you're talking about? I think you about? need a, an advisory committee, and not only just from the north, Chittenden County, but you, you need several places in, in southern Vermont, too. You need small schools. You need large schools. You know, so I might think about that. Is it already obvious? It sounds like it's going to look at the things you wanted to look at it. Yeah. And I'm asking you, is that how you would go about uh, assigning the task? I've heard that no, you'd like it to be broader. I mean, the point is, we're all here and we all have this as a shared responsibility is to try to get things right. That's why you run, that's why we all run and do it. So the next step should be is that how do we work as well as we can together towards these goals? Uh, really be uh, great just to hear people's thoughts on how to move forward. I, I would speak a little bit to that. Uh, I think part of what is behind that is the way that we fund special education and account for the uh, time samples within the schools and it's very rigid in looking at how staff members can work with students. And 
one of the questions that comes up is how can we be more flexible in meeting the needs of all students in the schools and regroup so that if, for instance, there are reading groups that involve students who are at a low level of reading but are not special education, mm -hmm. can't we look at them all in the same way based on their level of need and reassign staff according to their um, expertise? Mm -hmm. And the way it is funded at this point is that we can only specifically fund special educators for working with special education students according to their um, mandated services in their individual education plan. So what we really are asking, I believe that this is where that question has come from, is is there a more flexible way to look at special education funding mm -hmm. so we can broaden their impact mm -hmm. on the education of all students who have a need regardless of mm -hmm. whether that is written into someone's IEP. So we're hoping to look at, there are other models in other states where uh, special ed funding is used differently and to find an application that is better suited to be flexible in our instruction. Yeah, that's really helpful. I mean, I think I come to these meetings because to even learn about education and how it goes from the bottom up, top down, and there's a lot of work, obviously. We understand the analysis of concerns, etc. But you know, to really truly understand of where you think progress could be made, of like what are the values, what are the qualities and characteristics of what you would want to see that can make it work better, um, comes best when it comes from you. And uh, you know, so seeing how that works, I mean, understanding how that bill will go is that the bill was put out there purposely before town meeting in as uh, reasonable a shape as possible. So meetings like this could happen statewide. You can well imagine that there are a lot of legislators and others who now have a chance to comment. And if that's the ball, run with it. You know, don't just put it in your pocket. You know? And so what, it, to me, is that what I look forward to hearing is that what are the places where it could be better? What are the places where you're not so sure in a specific way as possible so you can go back and I can basically say to uh, my colleagues, this is what I'm hearing. Here's what they uh, would encourage us to do. Here's what they'd say, you know, maybe you want to slow down on this one. Maybe this one you aren't going too fast. That's the really interesting information because if that bill moves, it'll go through the House, then it'll go through the Senate. When it goes to the Senate, the Senate is usually one of those places that does that modification. So I think for us to be if we want to get what we want, we need to be in tune with an overall process. In the same way all of you listen to citizens when you go out and forming your own budget and work. And uh, I think that's an area for us to be uh, as constructive as possible. So I, that, you know, you know, make it flexible is a message I can bring back. And, you know, make sure you have uh, stakeholders at the table in that process is another message I can bring back. And so thank you. Well, there's another message, and I always like to say, what about the unspecial? I mean, we, we uh, devote so much time and energy to one particular area where we dropped the top areas. And so uh, we used to have programs for gifted and talented individuals. Mm -hmm. We need more of those. I think you brought up a very good point. I know that uh, one of the organizations that a number of parents have used around here has been the Governor's Institutes of Vermont which basically has offered opportunities for kids to really motivate them and move in all, of, all sorts of things. It started out in arts, but it's moved on to uh, you know, mathematics, science, all sorts of pieces, is that uh, they get some state funding, and uh, basically they're right up there with all the other organizations that are at risk at the point on a very long list, and we'll see what we'll do. And their point is very simple, is that um, the money that they use is make sure that kids who could not afford to go, they could be a tuition-based model, but the kids who could not afford would have advantage to be able to, uh, you know, take that, you know, greater leap. So there's, there's a lot to figure out. I'm sure that uh, nobody wants to be in anybody else's shoes right at this moment and come into these decisions. Yes. The Governor's Institute, so you said they're in danger of losing funding? Oh, yes, they, they right up there with the Vets Home, right up there with the pr Ladies' Prison, right up there with the Council on the Arts, the Council on Humanities, the Historical Society, the uh, Bennington County Industrial Corporation and all of its peers. 
um, right up there with uh, maybe we shouldn't be doing workforce education and training money, maybe all of these things. Are, people are basically saying is that the growth rate basically that we're seeing in spending is around 5%. The growth rate that we're seeing in revenues is around 3%. That doesn't work. And all of the one-time fixes that bring those lines together have been pretty well used and it's time to get on a more sustainable pathway because the growth rate that we're seeing on the other side is not as strong as it should be. And I think uh, people are reluctant to change that 3% revenue just by taxing people because it all this is based upon an economy. If you overtax it, your economy won't grow and you want to really look for ways where you um, have more earnings, where actually individuals have more dollars, so it's a smaller percentage of their disposable income to pay for education, to pay for health care, to pay for the things that we want to live in um, uh, Vermont. And our idea of the Vermont we both live in and want to live in. So that's, that's the work you know, the, in general, but it really needs the specifics at this level as to what would work better. Everybody wants efficiencies, everybody wants things to be effective. And, uh, you know, we keep driving ourselves towards that uh, with the idea that it's, um, and it is possible. There are always changes that we can make better. It requires all of us actually, uh, you know, working very hard at it as best we can with each other. We're entering our, our final minutes. We're going to be done at, we promised we'd be done at nine. If we're done a little bit earlier, that's fine. Is there anyone who hasn't spoken that, that would like to speak or a topic that hasn't been brought up that you would like to bring up? We can continue on the same, but I just want to give everybody an opportunity. We're going to be done early. Have we talked? I got here a little bit late. Have we talked at all about the consolidation aspect of the bill? No, to do a that has come up. I mean, I, I guess there's that and there's the 2% cap that's in the education bill. I mean, I think these are... The bill in general was brought up, Dave, but okay. we didn't talk to specifics. So to, me, I, to me, anyway, I've already spoken to Alice Miller about this. I think they're lousy ideas, and I think they would particularly impact us here in a, in a bad way. I, the consolidation, I, I think overall, there's a sense, the legislature must have had a sense anyway, that there's a statewide spending problem, uh, a statewide problem in general that this bill is trying to address. And to me, there isn't a statewide problem. There may be spending problems in some parts of the state. There may be governance problems in some part of the state. But here, we don't have a spending problem. Uh, and so to cap our spending at 2% annually, uh, I think would, would be counterproductive. Um, I've yet to hear how it would be beneficial to this district to uh, in terms of outcomes to consolidate into a K-12. to uh, So that's my opinion. I don't know how other board members feel, but I, mean, I think the bill needs a lot of work. <coughs> Larry? Just like to add on to what Dave said, uh, no one has come out with any, any sort of uh, uh, suggestion that there's any money to be saved in that. In fact, there's a lot of literature that indicates just the opposite, that uh, it'll cost us more if we do. Um, go down the path of uh, consolidation. And there are several areas in the state that are voluntarily uh, doing consolidation. Schools are joining. Uh, so it's on the table. Schools that find it appropriate are addressing it. To address it from the state level to, to force us into situations, I, I agree with you, David. It's uh, extremely counterproductive. I um, think any bill that makes the assumption one size fit all, yeah. you know, because I think Dave is right. It, it's not necessarily a statewide issue. And, and when we listen to the Secretary of Education, I mean, she specifically is talking about schools that are far smaller than what we, we have here, you know, high schools with well under 100 students that can't offer the diverse offerings that, uh, that we, we have here. This, we're, we don't really fit where, uh, where I see a lot of what's talked about in the bill, and, I, and that would be my concern. And the 2% and cap is, uh, is you know, I, I think, as, as you even said, Bill, we've done a lot of work, and a lot of good work, the boards have, the administration have, to keep our budget and increases mm -hmm. reasonable. I don't know how well mandates and, and artificial caps always work. 
I, I know. I mean, we've had these proposals before. This was a, well, a proposal that uh, came out of the previous administration at one point, and I think uh, uh, there's probably any number of reasons why a bill design that was put in there, is, and uh, it's a long process on that. Uh, but, but, you know, I think we, every time we hear words, we should really ask ourselves, what do they mean? Consolidate what? At what level? I mean, there's a lot of cons you have a large supervisory union, you know, and so part of what you're hearing is it would it be called a supervisory district or things along the line. Those are all administrative consolidations, which is something that you do regularly. I think you look for ways to do that. And I think the design of the bill is more or less along the line is that districts would figure out are there ways to solve problems. And you might say these are not our problems. These are some others that we could solve you know, with it. I think one of the ways <coughs> things that are hard to solve around here is getting the right number of students in the right school at the right time for the right purpose. That's something that collectively you could do. Right now, I think your motivation is to protect each unit because each, for each particular basic level because that's where the dollars come from. You know, that would be something that this area could be poised to really do good work on. You might well say is that in order to meet our economic development <coughs> needs, there need to be less obstacles between you know, the career development center and the regular high school and back and forth. We've talked about that over the years. So there could be opportunities in here. And to make your own case as to how to contribute to the whole, because what you're talking about is really the problem. You have two high schools that are too small right next to each other, you know, and guess what? You're paying for it, because it's a statewide tax. You say that, you know, because everybody chips in at the end of that pool. Now, I think you could say we are best practices in this way. And you might also learn where we're not best practices, where we could learn from other people. Whether it's that idea I brought to you about how you can actually move your classes so that people really have the career pathways that you want, so that they really are fully contributing citizens that earn good dollars and support their communities. So, you know, there's always in all of these things that we look at. There's downsides and there are upsides. And I would just remember, look at both. Don't just look at one or the other. You know, have the courage to doubt it. Are you saying there's, um, there's room for freedom in that bill from district to district? I think so. Yeah. No, no I think your leaders here have studied it and look at it fairly hard. I think they're interested in having the, you know, the best system we can. I think the real challenge for us is to work maybe slightly larger and slightly less in our own school silos one by one or our own boards one by one, but to work you know, amongst each other and to find the best ideas. I, mean, I think that would be uh, where the progress lies. Um, going back to the, the bill, I, David mentioned uh, taxpayers' acceptance or uh, not of the, uh, of the level of spending that we have in the state of Vermont towards education. Uh, I was under the assumption, and I think a lot of taxpayers are too, that this bill was going to somehow address that. I can't, I've been through the bill, not as many times as Mr. Pembroke has, but I've been through the bill several times, and I can't identify anything that's going to have a major economic impact on the taxpayers, the property taxpayers in the state of Vermont. The two biggest components in any of our budgets that we've just been over are special ed and payroll uh, costs and benefits to our staff. And yet I find nothing in that bill that really steps out and says, Here's how we can make a difference. So all of the peripheral things that we've gotten occupied with don't seem to be amounting to a whole lot. And I think the taxpayers are going to be disappointed in that. That's well, well, you are. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. what I would want to say to you is, is that what I should say is that you want to see specific pieces that address pensions and special ed that in the bill basically say uh, would lead to reduced costs. Am I hearing you correctly? That's correct, and I, and I thought that was the message you folks heard as well, due to the length of, out of the last elections. That my gosh, we have to do something. And all I'm saying is I, I can't I, I can't find that something. Well, those are the two somethings that you would focus on. Are there other budgets that that's that's yeah. eighty or ninety percent of our budget, our okay. local budget is is payroll and, and special ed. Okay, well, and, thank and you. And within within that, are they the health care costs? 
Yeah, well, there, is, part of it. there is part a piece of on health care here. Mm -hmm. Frank, did you want to add something? <clears throat> yeah, just that um, it seems like whenever we talk about this consolidation issue, it always you know, sort of defaults to the cost savings, the supposed savings costs or expenses or, or non-costs. Um, and we get away from the benefits that kids might get from having a consolidated district level where we do the kinds of things that you were mentioning, Bill, and being able to, you know, have the discussion about all the kids instead of in our silos. Yes, everybody faces that dilemma. Sometimes it's very good is to have, you know, very small cellular pieces. Sometimes it isn't. You know, I'm not an expert on education. I haven't said that has been, you know, for me personally, this is valuable. You all, that doesn't mean that I, I'm not going to try to figure out whatever I can either. Just as I'm sure you're spending a lot of time trying to figure out other things. But one of the good things that did happen, and I'm, I'm sure Karen will attest to this, is when we put money into the early childhood care, we had great benefits that may reduce the cost in the future of special education mm -hmm. uh, in terms of how many kids would be qualified for special education. Special ed's very difficult right, of all the people who provide it. The early intervention yeah, happening in, in fourth, in, in, at the four-year-old four level is, is very, very important. What, what were the uh, decreases? The decreases in numbers of students potentially going to special, I don't have that number with me. But what we do see is that children get referred to us for questions about their development and we're able to provide intervention suggestions prior to going to the special ed process. And, um, on many, many occasions, and that is something we're starting to track. I just don't have the number with me, but I can, get, I can probably get that. But eventually, that because of this intervention, it will lead to less students in special ed. That's reducing the courses. There's a lot of great long-range long strategies out there. The problem is the short-range strategies. The, um, for, don't don't get hung up on the consolidation. There's there is a lot of flexibility in this bill, and the area that um, I assume the SVSU would focus on is what's called the integrated educational system. Um, you can continue with your current governance structure, provided that you can prove to the secretary and the state board of ed that you can deliver the goals that are set out um, within the bill. Um, I haven't yet figured out how you do that. Um, you know, clearly it's going to be a discussion of all the boards getting together to try to assume they <coughs> want to keep their autonomy, somewhat autonomy. Um, they're going to have to all get together and, do, and figure out a way to structure um, a system whereby they can demonstrate that to Montpelier. Um, the difficulty is going to be the CDC who's going to need a dance partner because the, the pure, pure size of them requires them to dance with somebody. Um, and the other impact that we may potentially have is uh, Bat and Kill uh, Supervisor Union. They're going to have to find a dance partner. And the two of them together aren't large enough to have their own dance. Um, so, and I haven't looked at uh, Wyndham Southwest to see what their size is, um, to see how they play in the game, but um, the SVSU, as it sits, can get together and hopefully have a conversation to figure out how to deliver the target goals. number is 1100. Target number is 1,100, but I, 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 you know, it's it's the goals that are the the tricky part, um, and we're somewhat of a victim of our own success. We're actually a fairly, actually, we're probably one of the most efficient SUs in the state. Um, and I don't know who brought it up, Dave yeah. or somebody, of why why this is happening because they're seeing other uh, Bill or Mary, you might be able to help me. I forget there's. 34 different 
governance structures or something in the state of Vermont. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, it's um, you look at their picture on the wall up there, and it, it's a little obnoxious, frankly. But um, it's twelve hundred school board members in the state of Vermont. You know, we've um, we've done a good job. We've been recognized of doing a good job, and uh, hopefully, we don't have if it's the board's desires collectively to um, keep some autonomy. Um, it's a board's job to get together and figure out how to deliver those goals. There is, I would say, Larry, there's some significant cost containment in there. Um, the whole harmless revision is significant. Um, it, nobody understands, and I don't even understand, how all these phantom students is a new phrase that's going across the state. Um, but those are all driving that base tax rate of a buck. Didn't put it on the table. It's on there. Yeah, I didn't see the numbers, Rick. I didn't see the numbers equated to us as to what oh, the city. I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if anybody understands how much that is growing. That dollar base rate is the problem. That's right. Because this stuff has been compounding for but, years. But I think that's the problem in the further discussion. It has to be out on the table so that across the state folks do understand within their areas and districts what it actually can mean. Yeah, we don't have any phantom students, so if that's the question, right. I just want to, I mean, right. we, we don't experience that. But what's happened is you've had a small district up north that is losing enrollment. There's this protection, this three and a half hold harmless right. protection, and it's compounded. The formula is written, it's compounded these people, so, you know, they've got 25 kids in their building, but they, they're showing equalized pupils of 100 kids. I mean, that's an, that's an obnoxious example, but, and the rest of the state has to pay for those 75 kids but because they gotta be, grow the base tax. That would be the same of what government um, has done. I mean, Brad James things. should very easily be able to put that number together. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, so I, what is, is there a total number? Of the yeah, the, students? well, there's a, total, like, there's a total number of students. I don't know if Brad's gone to the extent. Uh, I thought I'd seen a figure, but I don't. There is a dollar for the whole homeless cost. that it's got to be a line item for that. I don't know what that number is, but right. Um, it's millions. Yeah, it's it's in millions. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's millions, but I, it's a question of whether it's three or it's 30. <laughs> you know, and um, so. And the small right. schools as, as a whole don't spend more than their total number of students. You know, they're, they're drawing about the same. <laughs> the cost that they draw is for the number of students that they have. They match on you know, the state's um, figures. But nonetheless, this, this whole harmless clause <laughs> is rather odd because it does compound. It shouldn't compound. Right. It should be a, a, a bridge for a year or two. It was designed to create a soft landing, and right. I don't think they realized that this declining enrollment right. was going to last forever. Yeah, I mean, it, exactly. it, it has become an enabler for those schools to maintain themselves and stay open. And I'm not, you know, without the impact on their tax rate that would be there without that. Right. All right. We're, we're approaching 9 o'clock, uh, and that's when we, we hope to end. I want to thank uh, both of you for coming. <laughs> I mean, yeah. look, at, look at the balance here. <laughs> I, I, I applaud you for coming and coming in here and listening to us uh, because, uh, well, the balance. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be in your shoes right now. You have a very difficult uh, job ahead of, ahead of you and uh, um, for all the state of Vermont. And we will continue to, to keep that dialogue open. I got something Jim, over Jim, I, uh, I hope for our next meeting we could get the warning out as quick as possible because I noticed a few other legislatures uh, replied to Mary Lee saying they've already have something else on their agenda and they can't right. make ours. So whether it's the first Monday or the second of uh, April that, you know, we try and get as many as possible. We, and we have sent out, you know, repeated uh, emails out on this. So I don't know, do we want to look at a date before we adjourn that might work for everybody? I thought we did last time. We did. Well, but unfortunately, the, we had a few snow days and then whatever. Yeah, but, we should have sent that out to the legislators to decide today so they can all block in that date. Jim, we, we should meet at the, 
Whenever you can get the largest amount of legislation is when we should get together. Yeah. And Mary Lee did do that back and forth with the, uh, emails. We're expecting a few more today, but that, yeah. that didn't happen. Um, looking to see if we if we did set a date. I don't have it on my calendar. Does anyone know if we said it was going to be the next day? I think you tried to switch to the second Monday. Yeah. Some of the bill had something on the first Monday or something. The second Monday, second Monday, Monday of good. April would be the 13th. Sounds good. I'll start somewhere. So is I that, I have conflicts that seems the, the second third. Monday, Mary? 13th yeah, of April? Probably be fine. Um, it's my Thomas only, Jefferson's birthday. My only birth. comment I would make is that as things are rolling, and they will be starting to roll this week, um, yeah. is that you folks are, if something is flagging, I don't know. I'm concerned about or happy about or whatever to let us know. Mm -hmm. um, before, you, before you go, yeah. April 13th, that's your vacation week. Yeah. It is vacation week. So, so that's not, that probably is going to work. Yeah. Look, this is my Thank vacation you, week. This is <laughs> <been, laughs> the yeah, vacation week. I just, no, you wouldn't have any of it. That too. You're back in summertime. Yes. So it, yes, so it would either be drive up is the uh, the sixth of April too too early? That the first Monday. My concern is we haven't, and again, it's not to just meet to meet, mm -hmm. but we right. have only this is our second meeting in this whole year with what has is supposed to be, um, you know, many changes going on, and so that's why the conversation is good to have so we know where you're all at within these discussions. So I would say probably the earlier, you know, the April 6th is probably fine. Well, what about the 30th? I will be able to stay for about the first half hour because that's the Workforce Economic Development Partners and yeah. I think we actually have been doing a lot of good work and I'd like to stick with that. Right. What about the 30th of March? That's a couple of weeks. Three weeks. Be two, three, three weeks from today. Rather than going, I mean, there's, a, there's enough. As you say, things are moving rapidly, so right. it it would probably be two of us to go a little earlier. That would. That would be. Does that work, Bill? Well, I think what you'll find out at that point is you'll find out what bill has emerged from the House, and it will be in the Senate by then, I would imagine. And so at that point, your key person will be directing your attention towards the Senate, and House members can do that as well as you. I mean, talk to senators, but mm -hmm. the voting will be in the House at that point, leading them towards whatever resolution or not goes off all us. All right, well then why don't we hold the date to the 30th, and uh, um, do you want to do this location again? Do you think this, it's a little larger room, does this, can we, check this we might, we'll check. Plus the breakfast is better. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, thank you for uh, uh, parking is the only issue. Was nice. But they did park. They did par uh, uh, block off some parking for us. Yeah, it was very nice. Thank that was you for doing nice. that. So, is there any anybody else before we conclude? Anything else? Thank you all for coming. See you on the thirtieth. Next time.